All right, time to go teach. Hello and welcome to this next episode of Tutor Tutors where we are now moving a little bit further into biochemistry and we are going to be looking at polypeptides. So you might have been thinking we're going to go into proteins and we are, but there's something to know about them first before we actually get into proteins specifically. So on that note, targets of the day, first off, identify the different parts of amino acids, amino acids being the monomer that make up a polypeptide. So they have specific parts to them and we are going to have to learn and understand them. Next, describe how amino acids bond with each other. They perform dehydration synthesis just like every other type of biomacromolecule, but they make a different type of bond. Lipids make ester bonds, carbohydrates make glycosidic linkages, and these are going to make their own specific bond as well. And lastly, compare how amino acid polymers are different from other biomacromolecules because there is a very distinct difference in how we label these polymers compared to how we look at other polymers. So before we get any further, a little bit of vocab. First is protein. So as I said, you might have thought we were going into proteins, and we are because proteins specifically are a functional polypeptide. They are a polymer of amino acids, but just a polymer of amino acids would be a polypeptide. If that polypeptide functions, if it works, if it's able to do its job, then it is a protein. If that polypeptide chain has an error in it, or if that polypeptide chain does not work on its own, it by itself is not called a protein. It would just be called a polypeptide chain. So a protein must function. Otherwise, it's just called a polypeptide. And they are made of amino acids, which is their monomers. What do proteins actually do? Well, pretty much everything except for energy storage. We don't use proteins for energy storage because if you start to break down proteins, that means that you've already used up all your carbohydrates, you've already used up all your lipids, and you are not doing well. You are literally starving to death. So proteins we do not use for energy storage, that is like the worst, almost the worst case scenario that you could go into. So proteins do pretty much everything else though. They help you fight disease, they form parts of the cell, they control chemical reactions. They are going to be involved in making sure that a chemical reaction can take place or making sure that chemical reactions don't take place. They are going to be signals between cells. They are going to be the molecule that receives the signal from another cell. They are the molecule that allows for some things to enter the cell. They are going to be involved in pretty much all of the cell processes. Proteins are the working molecules for the functionality of that cell. If there are no proteins, the cell cannot function, period. So what are the monomers again? The monomers are those amino acids, and how do they get their name? Well, the amino acid, when we look at it, it happens to have two main groups off of its central carbon. So the central carbon is right here, and the two main groups are the amine group and the carboxyl group, or the carboxylic acid group and the amino group. And if we take the first part of that and the last part, we put it together, we end up with amino acid. And that's how amino acids got their name. So amino acids are named after the different groups on the front and back of them. And every amino acid follows with this specific structure. They all have an amine group on one side, a carboxyl group on the other side, a central carbon bonded to a hydrogen, and in the center, they have this variable side chain. That is called the R group. And the R group could be a lot of different things. There are 20 different amino acids, and that means there are 20 different variable side chains. So it could just be a hydrogen, and that would be glycine. Or if it happened to be a carbon connected to three hydrogens, that would give us alanine. Or it could just replace one of those hydrogens with a hydroxyl group, an OH. That would give us serine. We could get larger. We could end up with a couple more methyl groups here. 
and that will give us valine, or we could even have a little bit more branching and with a hydroxyl group in there, and that would be threonine. And these are just some random amino acids that I decided to put together. Just so you can see, that's what's happening at that spot, which is our R group. That variable side chain could be a lot of different things. And that's what distinguishes one amino acid from another amino acid. The rest of the structure is exactly the same. It never changes. Every single amino acid has the exact same structure except for that R group. So if we were looking at it, looking at it in our formal way with the ball and stick model. So here we have our hydrogens, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, our two oxygens, and then our hydrogen right there, and recognizing that there is that double bond between our carbon and our oxygen. That's the whole thing. So our amine group and our carboxyl group over here. And then, well, there are group could be a variety of different things. The way that these bond together uses dehydration synthesis, just like all of the other biomacromolecules. And so we're just going to look at how that's going to work out. So first off, we're going to bring in another amino acid. And the orientation here is extremely important. You see that it was the amine group and the carboxyl group that interacted between the two different amino acids. That happens in this way every single time. So our a backbone for our amino acids will always have this nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon backbone. It will follow that pattern consistently. NCC, NCC, we bring another one in. It's going to go in the exact same arrangement. And they make between our two different amino acids, they form a peptide bond. That is the specific name for a bond between two different amino acids. So let's bring another amino acid in, and you'll see the orientation stays exactly the same. The carboxyl and the amine group is going to interact. They will then release that water, and now we happen to have another peptide bond formed, and that can go on and on and on and on and on. A polypeptide can be a thousand or more amino acids in a chain. It can be massive. I only showed three. So this is a very, 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 very small polypeptide chain. But you can see that we have this repeating pattern, NCC, NCC, NCC. So we have the nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon. You can see how the amine group is. You can see where the carboxyl group was. It always follows the exact same pattern. And because of that, we can refer to each end of our polypeptide. We have the N terminus. This is the nitrogen terminus because it is a side that has our nitrogen. And then on the other side, we have the C terminus. Now, amino acids, the way that they get categorized is by polarity, whether or not they are nonpolar or polar. And that is not based upon the whole molecule of the amino acid. Because if it was, well, it would just be polar. Because the amine group, that's polar. The carboxyl group, that's polar. So amino acids, by definition, are polar. They have to be polar. They always will be polar. But when we categorize them, we don't categorize them by the entire amino acid structure. We only categorize them by the R group. So it's all about this side chain. If the side chain happens to be just a carbon bonded to three hydrogens, like alanine, well, then it would be a nonpolar amino acid. That's how we will categorize it, because it has nonpolar character. If, on the other hand, we just replace that hydrogen with a hydroxyl group, like serine has, then all of a sudden, that oxygen makes this R group polar. And since it makes that R group polar, that give, means that we will categorize it as a polar amino acid. So just be aware that that's the way that we categorize our amino acids. We do that by their R group. Otherwise, they'd all just be polar and there'd be no categorization and they'd all be the same. So that's what we use. So in summary of all this, 
the special type of bond that forms between our amino acids, that is called a peptide bond. That is a specific bond that always exists between the carboxyl of one amino acid and the amine group of the other amino acid. Dehydration synthesis takes place and a peptide bond is formed. That's how it gets the name polypeptide. Next, the polypeptide chain, if it's going to be considered a protein, it has to be able to perform its function, whatever that function is. If it's supposed to be connective tissue, where it's going to be used for connecting one part of a cell to another part, as long as it can function and do that, then it is a protein. If, for whatever reason, it can't function, then we just refer to it as a polypeptide chain. That's a very specific thing. There are no non-functional lipids, and there are no non-functional carbohydrates. It's only when we get to polypeptides that you can have a functional version of them and a non-functional version. And the amino acids, they're all exactly the same. They have the exact same structural components, except for that R group. And that R group is what we use to categorize them. It's what we use to name them. It is the distinguishing feature between every single one of our amino acids. So next time, we're going to look at how a polypeptide chain interacts to become a functional protein. Until then, be awesome, stay awesome.